Good evening all, and welcome to the tenth installment of Creepy Pasta Collections. No, you haven't heard any of these before, don't worry. I also have the exclusive privilege of being joined by a very special guest. For your listening pleasure, I present to you none other than the sensational Mr. Lonely Dark. He has agreed to join us tonight to recount some truly horrifying tales indeed. So make sure you're ready for some serious spooks. I would also like to let you all know that we are indeed coming towards the end of our mega giveaway. Today is the second day for your chance to win the ninth exclusive box. To win, be sure to drop that comment leave a like, hit the bell icon, and check that YouTube hasn't turned it off, and be subscribed. That's it. Those four little things. A winner will be picked the day after tomorrow. Just make sure you've entered yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's video in order for your entries to count. But without further ado, it is indeed time for you to all get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Mummy, my daughter's first word. Isn't that what every new mother is dying to hear? One word to magically transform this organic object into a new human being. All the pain and fear and doubt suddenly have purpose. One word and mothers will know that it was all worthwhile. I love you, mummy. I just wish little Claire had waited until she was born to say it. Over eight months pregnant, I was sitting in the car waiting for my husband to get back with groceries. I almost had a heart attack on the spot. I thought someone was in the car with me. So I jumped out to get a better look at the back seat. But, don't worry mummy, it'll be our little secret. The voice was coming from inside of me. I felt the vibrations as much as I heard it with my ears almost like the rumbling of indigestion. I didn't say a word when my husband got back. I was waiting for Claire to talk again. But when she didn't, I kept my mouth shut too. My husband had more than enough to worry about with his extra shifts at work. I didn't want him to add my sanity to his worries. I don't like that. It's nasty. I put down the salad I was eating, alone in the kitchen this time. Claire only spoke when I was alone. Usually, it was just an isolated word. Or sometimes, I'd catch her humming along to a song that was playing. If she didn't like something, she'd let me know. She didn't care for most vegetables and jazz music seemed to make her restless. As weird as it seems, it's something I got used to. I grew to the habit of asking her how she was doing, and if she was comfortable. I tell her about the things we do together, and talked about myself. Sometimes, if I were lucky, I'd hear her respond. A faint murmur. So far away, but so intimate, that I knew it could be nothing else. There are lots of colours, Claire answered once when I asked her what it looked like. But they're all black. It's warm and close and safe. I'm part of everything here. What about before you were there? I asked. What is the earliest thing that you can remember? I could feel her squirming. She didn't speak again for almost a day. 
until suddenly, when I was about to enter the shower, she said, I don't want to talk about it. Before isn't a nice place. The people living there aren't nice people. I didn't want to upset her, so I didn't pry any further. Besides, even thinking about it made me uncomfortable, and I felt as though my discomfort would be passed down onto Claire somehow. We were two halves of the same soul and it almost seemed like I could feel her thinking before she even spoke. Mummy? She asked me one night when I lay half asleep, in the solitary darkness. My husband was on a business trip, and it was just going to be me for a few days before I was due. Who else is inside you, Mummy? I told her that she was an only child, that she was so big, she took up my whole tummy all by herself, and that soon, she was going to be too big for even that. She would come out to where I was, and we would see each other for the first time. Are there nice people out there? She asked. I had to tell her the truth. If I didn't, I figure she could probably feel it. I told her that people try to be good, but some of them don't know how, but that she shouldn't worry, because I'm going to teach her how, and then she can teach everyone she meets. I was almost in tears as I said it, marvelling at the wonder I carried. Claire and I will have known each other more truly than any other mother and daughter before. Our bond would be stronger, and I was so happy to have this blessing, until... Don't lie to me, Mummy. I know I'm not the only one here. I told her not to be silly. I'd been to the doctors, and they showed me what it looked like inside. There wasn't anyone. One of them followed me, Claire interrupted. From the place before... Mummy... Make them go away. I did my best to reassure her, but I was completely helpless against her mounting distress. Don't let it hurt me. Don't let it take me back. I don't want to go back. I want to be with Mummy. She wouldn't listen to anything I said. I couldn't get through to her anymore. Listening to her crying inside me, was more that I could bear. But then she started shrieking, and I had to get out of the house. I hustled into the car as quickly and as swiftly as my swollen body would allow, and it made it even more difficult, now that Claire was thrashing and kicking inside. I was trying to stay strong for her, but I was so terrified as I ripped down the streets toward the hospital. I'm sure she must have felt that too. I was doing everything I could to stifle my sobs, when the kicking suddenly stopped. There was no movement at all, no sounds, and I thought that was even worse than the crying, until she spoke again. I have to go away, mummy. It was nice talking with you. I was at the hospital now. I practically drove straight through the glass door in front of the emergency room. Don't go, Claire, don't go. But I didn't say it out loud. Instead, I said, Please help me. There's something wrong with my baby. Then Ars asked me how I knew. And I didn't know how to answer. I just started crying again. They put me in a wheelchair and brought me into the examination room. The nurse said that she would be right back, but I didn't want to be left alone, at least while someone was here. I could tell myself that Claire wasn't speaking because of them. If she stayed quiet when I was alone though, oh yeah. Don't cry mummy. I held my breath, desperate to catch every word. 
Claire was speaking so faintly that I could still barely hear it over the frantic double percussion of my heart. You're not going to be alone. The one from the before place is here. He promises to be good. But I want you to be careful, Mummy. Goodbye. The nurse was back, and there was a doctor with him. I think they were trying to ask me some questions. But my whole awareness was so focused on any moment or sound from within that I couldn't register what they were saying. They started doing an ultrasound, although it took a long time before I stopped shaking enough for them to get a clear picture. The whole while, Claire didn't say a word. That was okay though. She never did when people were around. Maybe when they were gone, she would. But then the doctor gave me a big smile and I let out gasps of stale air that I didn't even know I was clinging to. I want you to know that you have nothing to worry about, the doctor said. The baby is in perfect health. I'm sorry, I told him. I don't know what I was thinking. I shouldn't have bothered you. Don't worry about it. It's common for expecting mothers to have anxiety or panic attacks, even hallucinations sometimes. He said this as he removed his gloves. Hallucinations, yeah. I guess it's a pretty traumatic time for the body. Exactly, he said. But I want you to know that nothing in the world is wrong. Just a few weeks, and you're going to be holding your son for the first time. My son? Yes, mum. Didn't you know? Look here. It even almost looks like he's smiling. Ten, maybe twelve years old, wearing a leash attached to one of those dog training collars with the inward facing spikes. She was sitting on the balcony of my neighbor's apartment, her dirty bare legs dangling through the iron bars. She stared at me where I sat with my book on my own balcony, so I gave her a little wave. She didn't so much as blink in return. She just kept swinging her legs through the bars and staring. I figured the collar was some kind of ironic fashion accessory, although it hardly matched with her threadbare summer dress. Five minutes later, she was still staring and I was beginning to feel a bit uncomfortable. I set my book down and asked, What's your name, Missy? He calls me Cheesy, she replied, flashing all her little teeth like she was posing for a picture. That's an unusual name. Cause he says I make him sick, like cheese. Oh. I looked down at my book. How the hell was I supposed to reply to that? Are we friends now? She asked, squishing her face between the bars. Okay, friends. I couldn't help but smile at her innocent charm. Can I call you something other than cheesy though? He also calls me cockroach. She chirped conversationally. Little freak. Shit face. Who calls you these things? Your father? But she didn't get a chance to reply. A vicious tug on the leash tightened the spikes into her throat. Her fingers clutched at it, but she couldn't loosen the grip. A moment later, she was helplessly reeled back inside her apartment. I ran to the edge to look, but my vision was obstructed by the jutting concrete, which separated the balconies. I just saw her being dragged inside, and then heard, What did I tell you about talking to strangers? He asked me a question. I knew it was a mistake to let you outside. The sliding glass door slammed. I couldn't make anything out after that. My stomach felt like I had just eaten a pound of garbage. I've never spoken to my neighbor before. A severe, quiet man who wore dark sunglasses. I didn't even know he had a kid. He didn't seem like the type, although there's always a chance she wasn't his. Either way, I called Child Protective Services to let them decide. They thanked me for the info and said they would send someone over. I walked around the rest of the day feeling like a hero. I had a few errands to run, but I got back just in time to see an authoritative black woman in a pristine blue suit standing outside my neighbor's open door. I'm sorry, there must have been some sort of mistake, he said from inside his apartment. I live alone. No kids. 
My apologies. I must have gotten the wrong address, she said. Would you mind if I just take a peek inside so I can check off my forms? The pause was slightly too long. No, that's not okay. This is my home. My sanctuary. Go bother someone else. It'll only take a few. The door slammed shut. The woman immediately began knocking again, but there was no response. Excuse me, CPS? I asked. She looked me up and down as though evaluating my potential to be a scumbag. You the guy who called? She asked. I nodded. What's your next step? My next step? What's your next step? She snapped. I don't have any next steps without signing a warrant from a judge, and I'm not going to get that without some evidence. You get a picture or anything? I shook my head. Well, call me if you do. She was already halfway to the elevator. That's it? What do you mean that's it? I got three more cases tonight, and chances are at least one of them isn't going to be so pretty as this. I got a job to do, honey, but I can't do it here. Sounds like I had a job to do too. He couldn't stay in there forever, right? Either he'd leave with her and I could follow them, or he'd leave alone, and I'd have a chance to talk with her and find out what was going on. I brought my book into the hallway and sat down to wait. Half an hour did the trick. The door opened and sunglasses gave a quick, paranoid scan. They landed on me. What are you doing? He asked. Lost my key. I lied. Gotta wait for my roommate to get home. He disappeared back inside and the door closed. I thought I missed my chance, but a moment later the door opened again and he exited with Cheesy. She was still wearing the collar but the leash was bundled up and he rested his hand on her shoulder so it was barely visible. As they passed, she glanced back at me as if to say, Goodbye friend. But it wasn't goodbye yet. I followed them out of the building while pretending to stare at my phone. But I couldn't get a clear shot of the collar. I snapped one of them together, but that didn't seem like enough for a warrant yet. I might feel like a masquerading pillar of vigilante justice, but I certainly wasn't as smooth as one. By the time the pair had gotten to the car, the man had must have noticed me a dozen times. The chase was on. We'd only been out in the night for about five minutes, when he suddenly pulled off the road into a dirt clearing beside some cornfields. I was so caught up in the excitement that I hadn't even paused to consider what I would do when I actually caught them. He must have known his secret was out though, and if something happened to the girl tonight, I'd never forgive myself. I pulled off the road and parked behind him while dialing 911. Put the phone down. The man had gotten out of his car. He walked around to the passenger side to drag the girl out by the leash. The powerful yank sent the clear signal about who would pay the price if I didn't obey. I hung up and got out of the car. Did I tell you to get out? He barked. Back in. Keep driving. What the hell is wrong with you? I shouted, hoping to draw some attention to our dark road. The man flinched at the sound. Where do you get off putting a collar on? If you knew her, you'd do the same. Or worse. He growled. His hand turned white from clenching the leash so hard. This little freak deserves it. Daddy, I can't breathe, the girl whimpered. Shut your disgusting mouth. I couldn't take this anymore. I barreled headlong into the man, throwing him against the car. One of his arms was tangled in the leash, and that gave me a chance to pin his free arm and punch him across the face. The man slid to the ground, dragging the girl with him, as she clutched at her collar and howled. I couldn't divert my attention long enough to unfasten the collar, so I just stumped on the man's hand that was holding the leash. God damn it, idiot! He shouted. Do you have any idea how long it took me to capture her in the first place? Now look at what you've done. I did look, and damn I was proud. The man lay there nursing his hand while I unfastened the collar from around the girl's neck. She was grinning from ear to ear. I'm gonna call the police now, I warned him. Stripping his wallet and ID. You better stay put, unless you want the collar on you. Don't bother, he moaned. We'll both be dead before they arrive. An idle threat from a desperate man, or so I thought, until I glanced back at Cheesy. I guess I hadn't noticed how long her neck was under the collar. At least twice as long as a neck ought to be, and it was growing by the second. I swallowed hard but felt like there was a cotton in my throat. What are you waiting for? The man shouted. 
all pretense of discretion gone. Run! The neck was still stretching. Her figure stayed the same, her face was all smiles, but her neck was almost as long as her whole body now. It twisted sinuously through the air as though it had no bones at all, stretching luxuriously after its confinement. Little Freak wasn't such a bad name. Did you know that most of their body is hollow cavity which stores their folded neck, or that silver collars were the only way to keep them from extending? I didn't. Not until I read the papers, stuffed in his wallet. Not before I stood in shocked awe on the side of the road and watched her jaw hinge to consume him whole. Police dispatch, what's your emergency? Faintly droned my phone. Friends? I asked the girl. She nodded, choking the man's still screaming body into her grotesquely swollen neck. Friends, I repeated as I hung up the phone, backing into my car. Her eyes watched me while she continued to gag the body down. Well shit, so much for being a hero, but at least I was still a hero to her? I'll never see her face again. If my blindness only meant scrubbing this dirty world into an ocean of black mist, then I think I could learn to accept that. Stealing my wife from me before her time though? That I'll never forgive. It's bad enough she's sick and fading from me already, but not being able to see her, to say goodbye, is killing me as surely as it is her. I suppose it is my fault though. I spent the last few nights leading up to my accident, shifting around the rigid hospital chair beside her bed. I was so tired that I could barely walk straight, and all it took was a patch of black ice in the parking lot to pitch me to the ground. My head slammed into the asphalt and everything went dark. The black mist didn't lift, but next I could remember I was sitting in my own hospital bed with a nurse explaining what happened. Post-traumatic cortical blindness, she was saying. It seems like there was some damage to your optical cortex when you hit the ground. Where's Sarah? Where's my wife? I want to see her. The nurse just coughed, giving me time for my own words to sink in. There's a chance your vision loss is being caused by pressure on the optic nerve, which can be potentially corrected with surgery. The doctor doesn't want to get your hopes up though. You should be prepared to adjust to life without sight. It's true I couldn't see the nurse or the hospital room, or even my own hand an inch away from my face. But the worst thing was, I could still see. It just wasn't the same world I left behind. I fumbled for words, trying to explain the black and purple vines which dangled around me from unfathomably tall trees. How they swayed gracefully in an unfelt wind, bending across their hundreds of joints like fingers bending back and forth upon themselves. I pointed at the greasy orange sky and the swarms of softly teeming insects, which obliviously paraded towards me from all sides. Hallucinations aren't unheard of after acute vision loss. It was hard to take her seriously, when her voice seemed to be coming from a giant blue flower whose bell-shaped petals seemed deep enough for me to stand in. If this was a hallucination, then it was clearer and more vivid than anything I could have possibly ever imagined. I tried again to explain the infinitesimal detail of the insect's uneven carapaces, but she excused herself to leave without letting me finish. I never even got the chance to tell her that I could feel the thousands of tiny legs crawling up my body as the insect parade passed through the origin of a disembodied perspective. I was stuck somewhere between worlds. I could still feel the coarse fabric of the hospital blanket, but so could I feel the smooth gloss of each leaf and barky tree in the sudden jungle I was mired with. I pulled on one of the purple digits, only to see it coil around my arm, inquisitively feeling me in return. I tore away and tried to stand, leaning on a cold metal IV pole that I couldn't see. I felt I was going insane, and there was no amount of reasonably toned nurses or insightful doctors that would convince me otherwise. I knew instinctively that I had to find my wife. Sarah was the only real thing left to ground me in this world that I was supposed to be in. It wasn't easy navigating two worlds at once. 
Even when I shuffled around until I found the door to my room, I still had to push myself through a thick curtain of fingers which had inconveniently infested the portal. It was slow navigating the invisible hallways while plowing through the thick jungle foliage, and to make matters even worse, the blue-white sun was beginning to smolder and set in the orange sky. My hearing remained fixed to this world strangely enough, so at least I was able to hear people approaching and not run into anyone. Once someone pointed me to the main elevator, I had no trouble from there. I visited Sarah so many times that I could find the way with my eyes closed. It was so disorienting to feel myself rise in the elevator, seemingly fly directly into the air, ducking and dodging branches as I did. I hesitated before her door to ask the passing footsteps. Sarah's room? Are you sure you should be out of bed? Let me go ask, is my wife in here? Yes, but she should be resting too. She had another grand mal seizure last night. Hold on, I'll see if I can go find the doctor. Footsteps. My hand was on the door, but I couldn't quite bring myself to push through. Sarah had been in the hospital for the last three months, getting weaker and weaker each passing day. There had been a number of tentative hypotheses, but there has yet to be a definitive diagnosis for the underlying issue. I guess that's why I've been holding out hope for so long. If she could get sick without a reason, then she didn't need a reason to get better. All those nights I'd spent beside her, watching her pale face and listening to her shallow breathing. It was all some kind of cosmic misunderstanding that would sort itself out on its own. It was only now, when I knew I couldn't lie to myself anymore, the black and purple fingers protruded thickly, like spreading plants in the wide branch beyond, converging on a recumbent form of the exact size and shape of a human. Some of them reared their sensitive tips, only to plunge directly back into the mass, pulsing and squirming as they did, fought one another to penetrate farthest. All too clearly, I could imagine them puncturing her body or forcing themselves down where her throat should have been. If this wasn't a hallucination, then it was explaining an illness that an entire hospital couldn't decipher. Sarah? I opened the door. Are you in there? Her gentle moan. That's all I've heard from her the last week. It hadn't made any sense to the doctors as she appeared conscious, but it made sense now. How was she supposed to speak this whole time with those things lodged in her throat? Sickened and furious, I flung myself at the warped vines, carelessly clattering through her invisible bedside table as I did. I seized one near where her head must have been and pulled with all of my strength, feeling it go taut to resist me as I did. Other vines were reacting, unwinding themselves from her to seize me by the arms and legs. I fought through it, clutching and tearing, even sticking my teeth into the rubbery thing. More fingers crawled from the branches above, circling around my arms, up my shoulders, slithering around my neck. Someone help! Get them off of her! I shouted. The fingers were constricting around me, but I didn't let go. I threw my whole body weight backwards, heaving and straining until something finally gave. Sarah was coughing and retching, the beeping of her vitals going berserk as I struggled. She was shaking so badly that the whole bed rattled. Each increment of progress agonizing to watch, as I knew the finger must be relinquishing its hold of her stomach and lungs, or however deep this corruption spread. All the while, my bondage was secured, ruthlessly tightening to cut off blood supply to my arms and crush my throat into a collapsing prick. She's having another seizure! Get a doctor in here! I was held so firmly in place that I couldn't even turn toward her. Not like I could see her if I could. What about him? He's not responding. Get him on the ground and keep his airway clear. Hands unwittingly pushed their way past the swarming appendages to ease me down. The pressure slackened, some returning their attention to the knot which surrounded my wife. Blood began to return to my limbs. I could feel, and as soon as I could breathe, I could fight again. I was gasping on the floor when the doctor entered the room. How could I tell? Well, there were certainly auditory clues as a gruff voice barked commands to the nurses, but more prominently was the knot of interlacing fingers which formed the shape of a human. They were spread so finely 
that every artery and vein must be filled, and I could clearly see them pulse and twitch as they tightened and relaxed, moving the doctor through the room like a puppet. Another seizure, the doctor said. I could see the strum around his head and the things inside him opened and closed his mouth, with smaller ones inside maneuvering his tongue and vibrating his vocal cords. Check her mouth. Make sure there isn't any vomit or obstruction. The fingers! I shouted, aware of how mad I must appear, rolling on the ground. Get them out of her! She can't! And gave him something to calm down. Diazepam, 400 milligrams should do it. They've got him too. Don't touch me! Don't let them touch Sarah! I tried to sit up, but someone was squatting on top of me and pinning me to the ground. I jerked as a needle slid into my thigh, but the pressure only increased. Something scoured through my veins. The humanoid network that was the doctor dropped to his haunches beside me, and I felt a warm hand run down my face to cut my chin. It was getting too dark to see anything at all. Just a nasty hallucination, that's all. Let's get you back to bed and see if we can't do something about those eyes. They had good news for me when I woke up. Not only were they able to alleviate the pressure on my optic nerve, but my wife had made a miraculous recovery during the procedure. I actually wept in relief when I opened my eyes in the hospital room and saw Sarah anxiously sitting over my bed. Just Sarah and the room. No fingers, no unfamiliar jungle, no crawling sensation of the insects or dodging alien trees. They told me Sarah was talking and eating and even walking on her own, although they warned me she was still stiff and slow to react. Stiff isn't how I would describe her lurching movements though. She seems more like a marionette doll to me, tethered by unseen strings from the inside and out. Suicide Bridge is a short overpass which runs nearby my house. It has laughably short concrete barriers, which do nothing to dissuade people from climbing over if they want to. Below, there is a treacherous drop. It's at least a 200 feet tumble along the sheer cliff and plummet into the canyon below. I've counted seven jumpers in the last year, but that doesn't really bother me too much. Even if there was a higher fence, they would just walk around. Block off the whole area? Well, maybe they'll just take some pills instead. I figure if someone is that determined to off themselves, they're going to find a way. What bothers me more is that I can see it from my bedroom window. I'm on the opposite side of the canyon, but still close enough for a clear view. The jumpers are even facing me when they cling to the concrete, muttering and sobbing as they work up the courage to perform the most cowardly act in the world. The first time I saw it, it really freaked me out. I called the police and everything, begging them to hurry. I waved and shouted at the guy as he staggered drunkenly up and down on the wrong side of the barrier. Just when I was about to get into my car and drive around the canyon to him, there he went. I swear he was even smiling as he soared through the air, arms spread wide to surrender himself to the welcoming darkness. Last month, there was another. I just flipped out my phone and recorded the whole thing. I justified that raising awareness about the suicides might encourage social activists or something to step up and get involved. If I'm being honest enough, my night was pretty dull, and I just thought it was cool. I posted the video to YouTube, but it was flagged and removed within 24 hours. No one subscribed would have got the notification anyway. I guess some people must have seen it during that time though, because I received this message shortly after. Send me the video file of the jumper and delete your own copy. My friends will give you $500 for it. I couldn't believe it. 
At first, I thought it was a scam. But then I figured some TV reporter wanted exclusive coverage for this story. He asked how I got the footage. I told him I could see it from my window. Then sure enough, as soon as I sent him the video file, I received $500 straight to my PayPal. I didn't want to press my luck, so I didn't send any follow-up messages after that. Two weeks later though, he contacted me again. Next time someone jumps, I want you to call this number. I figured it was a suicide hotline or something, and didn't think anything more about it. Last night though, I spotted another jumper clinging to the concrete barrier. A girl this time, still wearing her party dress. No doubt drunk or stupidly emotional over some breakup or drama. I called the line and thought that they would just handle it. My friends want to watch. A thousand bucks a ticket, the voice on the other line said. There was only one alarm going off in my head, and it was sounding because of the free money. He actually sent the 500 he promised before, so I figured he was good for it. Sure, it was weird as hell, but it's not like anyone was going to suffer from it. The girl would be jumping with or without an audience. So what was the harm? I gave the guy my address, and he said he would be there as fast as he could. And he wasn't joking. Two minutes later, a white van was screeching down my neighborhood like a torpedo. I met them outside, all six of them. And they asked if she was still there. I said yes, but I didn't know for how long. Yes, you could see her face from here. No, I didn't know who she was. It was dark in the parking lot, and I couldn't get a good look at them. But soon, they were hurtling past me up the stairs towards my apartment. Left in my hands were six neat stacks of twenties, all tied up with little rubber bands. I don't know how they got here so fast, but it was clear that they were ready. I followed the group up into my apartment, where I found them all huddled around my bedroom window. All men, middle-aged, impeccably dressed in suits or high-end collar shirts and slacks. I had discreetly stowed my cash in my nightstand and sat awkwardly on my bed. They were all talking fast at each other in another language, something I assume was Eastern European and I didn't want to interrupt. There was some paper exchanging hands too, as if I had a guess, I'd say they were placing bets. I was getting pretty uncomfortable, and I just wanted them to get their kicks and get out as soon as possible. It's no good, one of them said with an accent. It's not what I pay for. What's the matter? I asked. You can see her, can't you? Yeah, I see her. I see her changing her mind. I joined them at the window in time to see the girl clambering back onto the other side of the barrier. I could feel the eyes of all six men on me as I watched. We had a deal. It was the voice from the phone. We came to watch someone jump tonight. Well, that's up to her, not me, I replied casually. Although, it was impossible to ignore the inherent threat in the tone. You are hosting a party, no? Asked the guy. Don't let us down. Go talk to her. You want me to tell her to jump? It was getting harder to breathe. The weight of all those eyes was getting heavier. Damn it. Why did they all have to be so old and professional? I felt like I'd just walked into a board of directors and shit myself while they watched. I couldn't meet anyone's eye. It's either her or you, said the first speaker. Better hurry before she leaves. We'll be waiting for you. I never drove so fast in my life. Should I call the police 
and tell them that I was hosting a suicide watch party? I don't know if that's illegal, but it certainly wasn't going to get me any sympathy. Do I just keep driving and not looking back, and never return home? I had a lease, and a job, and… but even if I did run. These seem like the kind of men who know how to find someone. As much as I hated myself, I was taking the switchbacks, and within a few minutes, my car slammed to a stop just outside of the bridge. The girl. Where was the girl? I didn't see her anywhere, and my heart felt like it was going to bruise itself against my ribcage. It was beating so hard. I ran up and down the concrete barrier, conscious that the men in my apartment could see me the whole time. I almost tripped over the girl in the dark. She was leaning against the concrete on the side of the road, almost invisible from the overhead street lamp, half asleep. She's still quietly bumbling in the dark, a corruption of mascara down her face. I look back to my apartment, and I can see the light which shone a hungry eye peering out of the night. Come on, get up. Easy now. I put my hands under her arms and helped her to her feet. The girl in her early twenties could have been pretty under different circumstances. She hid her face in her hands and started sobbing louder, glancing back across the canyon. Then I took a deep breath. Stand up. There you go. I don't want you to be afraid, okay? My tongue felt huge and alien in my mouth. The words in my ears sounded like they were coming from someone else. I couldn't believe this was happening. I couldn't believe I was letting this happen. The girl sniffled and pressed herself against me as she struggled to stand. The warmth of her body was intoxicating. I pushed her back to arm's length, pulling her hand away from her face so she wouldn't look at me. Everything that you're feeling, everything that you're going through, I understand. But there's something I need you to understand too. She gave me a half smile, as I took a long and slow breath letting the air whistle out through a small hole in my mouth. I need you to understand that everything is going to get worse from here. If you can't hold it together now, how are you going to do it when your body gets old and no one even wants to look at you anymore? You think it's hard letting go of people? How about when you've been with them for five or 10 or 20 years and they still betray you. I don't know your story, but I know the stories of people like you, and I know this is the best your life is ever going to get. If it's not good enough, then it never will be. You might as well jump. She was still smiling, even with the makeup running down her face. It was beautiful to see. She thanked me and told me that I was right although the words didn't feel quite real. All I could think about was that beady eye of light on the other side of the canyon. I felt her arms wrap around me, but the warmth wasn't there anymore. Then she was climbing back over the concrete, over to the other side overlooking the terrible drop. I know I usually watch when they go, but not this time. I rushed to my car, trying to turn the music on before, but just as I was about to start the ignition, I heard the scream tear from her body, like it carried her soul with her. I turned on the music, as loud as it would go and drove back to my apartment. It was empty when I got back, but the money was still there in my nightstand. Left on my bed was a note that read, Great party, my friend. We enjoyed the show. Next week, we're going to come to watch again. So have another one ready for us then. There is no greater curse than the possession of a demon, nor greater honor than the visitation of an angel. 
God has blessed our home with his presence, and I am nothing but grateful for the miracle which has occurred, and yet I tremble as I write this, because through this trial we have learned one lesson most truly of all. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. Psalm 147, 10 through 11. To fear God does him as much honor as to love him, for both are equal expressions of belief. God does not give us the choice of which laws to follow. The comforts of modern life have seduced men into a pitiful state of moral lassitude, but our family does not compromise on our beliefs. Righteousness can be feigned for the sake of impressing one's neighbors, but the truth of our souls cannot be hidden from God. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. 1 Timothy 2.12 But the insolent girl would not be silent before my husband, not until I struck her. First she howled, then whimpered, and then she was still. How beautiful the fear of God had made my child. Elizabeth was only six years old when she turned from the path. She spoke when she was not addressed. Lies flowed from her mouth as naturally as truth. She refused to pray, and she showed no shame in drawing blasphemous monsters and images which did nothing to glorify God. My husband Luke and I prayed for her every night, but the Lord God knows that a child understands the weight of a cane more nearly than any word. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 22.15 Her high-colored dresses hid all the marks, and for a time Elizabeth showed enough respect for her parents not to speak against us. I should have listened to Luke, and not sent her to the public school where her mind could be further polluted by the unfaithful. Her rearing was impeccable, so there's no way I can explain the filth which began spewing from her mouth. I don't want to go. She said last Sunday morning, while I dressed her for church, I hate him. I hate God. God loves you, I tried to explain, but she wouldn't listen. No, he doesn't. God hates me too. Why would you say such a thing? I asked. Because he made you my mom. We didn't go to church that day. After Luke heard what she said, she was in no condition to go anywhere. The Lord knows I wept as much as Elizabeth did. It couldn't go on like this, I told myself. Luke thought she would learn in time, but I wasn't strong enough to endure her lessons. I cleaned my daughter's wounds and made her comfortable, but her blood was still on my hands when I prayed that night. Where did we go wrong? I begged from the quiet. Oh God, if you truly love us as we love you, send us an angel to grant us the happiness we deserve. I could see the light through my closed eyes, and I knew the spirit was with me then. I felt his warmth on my hands and face. I dared not look, or speak, or even breathe, afraid to disrupt the miracle in progress. For one divine moment, I knew my prayers were answered, and I was in heaven. The next moment, I heard Luke shout, FIRE! Smoke was billowing out from under our bedroom door. The hallway was an inferno, flames gutting between the floorboards, climbing the walls, igniting the pictures, and the wooden crucifixes pounded into the walls. I staggered towards Elizabeth's room, coughing and fell into my knees to crawl under the smoke. Luke grabbed me under my arms and heaved me towards the front door, but I kicked and fought him the whole way. Elizabeth, she's still in there. The Lord preserve her, Luke said, uncompromising as always. I was dizzy from the smoke, and I wasn't strong enough to fight off Luke. Before I knew what was happening, I was panting and heaving on our front lawn while the house burned. Elizabeth! I screamed through my ragged throat. Elizabeth! Where are you? Luke didn't let me go back in. I was screaming and crying hysterically, but he forced me to the ground and held me there until the fire department came. If Elizabeth was crying for us, I couldn't tear her over the roaring flames. Maybe she stayed quiet though more afraid of us than the fire. Luke prayed while the firemen battled the blaze. I didn't, knowing my prayers had already been answered. This was the happiness we deserved. Three strong men entered the house when the exterior had been doused. Veterans in full gear with masks and oxygen tanks. 
Elizabeth had nothing, and as sore as she was from her punishments, I don't know if she could have escaped that house even without the fire. Three men exited the house, their arms empty. Elizabeth was barefoot and walking unassisted between them. Her face was clear, unmarked from soot, her breathing slow and even, her skin pure white, unmarked by injury or burn. A miracle, Luke said. A miracle, the firemen were quick to agree. A curse, I wasn't brave enough to reply. We all stayed in a hotel that night. Luke was so exhausted from the ordeal that he slept soundly, but I couldn't help but lie awake listen to Elizabeth whispering to herself. She was traumatized, my reasoning said. She was trying to process what happened and she needed me to hold her and to tell her it would be okay. I almost got up a dozen times in the night to comfort her, but each time my muscles locked from some nameless instinct, as old as fear itself, which begged me to not approach the mumbling girl. Elizabeth is a good girl. A good girl. I heard her whisper. Elizabeth will not punish them. I pretended to be asleep, trying to match my husband's deep breathing. I couldn't get enough air though, and my involuntary gasping was to betray me because Elizabeth would sometimes sit rigidly upright to stare at me in the dark. I watched her through slitted eyes, not daring to move. No Elizabeth prayed too, you know. No the girl was obviously speaking to me, but all I could do was lie there and keep breathing. Do you know what she prayed for? I clenched my eyes tight. I felt so stiff that I might as well be dead. I didn't hear anything else, but I was too scared to look. A full minute before the silence became too loud, and when I opened my eyes again, the girl was standing right beside my bed. I jerked up, hopelessly tangling the covers in my surprise. Luke woke with a start and flailed around the nightstand until he turned on the lamp. What is it? What's going on? Elizabeth was back in her bed, rigidly upright, just staring at me, smiling. I forced a smile in return. Nothing's the matter. We're all okay now. Get some sleep, Elizabeth. Luke grunted and turned the lights back off, rolling his back towards me. Good night, lady, Elizabeth said. I don't know how many hours it took me to fall asleep after that, but I never saw Elizabeth lie down the whole time. Over the next few days, the insurance inspectors concluded it was an electrical fire, although there was so little info in the report that it seemed more like speculation to me. Elizabeth hasn't given us any trouble since. She's mild and dutiful in her behavior and her prayers. She loves to draw, but the serene passionless faces she repeats over and over are far more disturbing than the monsters she used to decorate the pages with. Luke couldn't be happier, of course. He's got the perfect little angel he's always wanted. He doesn't seem to realize that we've always had an angel, or that somehow she didn't make it out of that fire. She's watching as I write this, smiling and swinging her feet, but I don't care. She may even read it, if she likes. It doesn't matter. God already knows there is more divinity in an imperfect child than all the angels in heaven. I worship him with my fear now, so if that truly pleases the Lord, let him hear me and send my daughter home. But she's giggling now, so perhaps he has other plans in store for me. Though the wind bellows fierce across my face, like the howl of a nameless beast. Though the moon twists shadows into abyssal creatures, and the gates of hell within my companion's eyes. I am not afraid. I will be, he promises, but not yet. You see, this is not the scariest story in the world. This is just a tribute. My brother Jake read the fabled story on an ancient scroll, or so the old man swore to me. I believe the psychiatrist referred to the explanation of sudden onset psychosis. All I know for sure is that last week I met Jake for a drink after work and listened to him complain about his wife for an hour, the way she bossed him around, the way she never considered his feelings. Then on to ramble about his job and a camping trip he and his coworkers planned to get away from it all. Three days later, I received a phone call from the police station. Did I know Jake? Of course, he's my brother. 
They didn't know why his naked body was covered in blue paint, or why he was running down Main Street screaming at pigeons. No officer, I'm not sure why he was doing that. Speaking to Jake in the hospital was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. His eyes were milky pools, which bulged so disgustingly from their sockets that I was afraid that they'd fall out. His breathing came in short bursts of ragged gasps, as though he was constantly forgetting and then being reminded that he was being chased. Even his skin seemed to have aged, fresh wrinkles threatening to melt off his face entirely. I never knew a nobody. Nobody never knew of me. He repeated that line frequently, sometimes looking in my direction, though never seeing me. It was punctuated with other nonsense such as, you see him born, but you never see him unborn. Or, I felt it drinking me, like I was a bottle, and it couldn't be quenched. I couldn't make heads or tails of it, neither could our parents, or our relatives, or any of the long line of doctors who paraded through the room. By the third visit, I was seriously considering leaving and never returning. What was the point? Whatever happened to him, my brother wasn't in there anymore. I wrestled with that thought all day, making excuses to delay until finally near midnight. The guilt overpowered my hesitation. I decided to drop by for just a moment to see if his condition changed. It hadn't but something did. There was an old man sitting beside his bed, endlessly wringing his hands and muttering to himself. His stained trench coat and wild matted hair suggested a homeless person, and I wouldn't have been surprised if he had his own room in the psych ward. Do you know Jake? I asked. Does anyone anymore? The old man replied with the articulate, measured words of a stage actor. Do you know what happened to him? I asked, still standing by the door. Mr. Sandman, Jake's voice gurgled like wet mud. Mr. Sandman, dream me a dream. I do, the old man answered. It was almost surreal to hear such an even, intelligent voice from such a disorderly man. He read something he oughtn't to, and it's driven him quite mad. Convinced by my companion's certainty, I sat in the chair beside him and searched his face for answers. The eyes which met my gaze, as I have already mentioned, were akin to the gates of hell. I suppose such a fanciful description requires elaboration. It's not that his eyes were abnormal, just as an arch of stone may seem quite natural in almost any setting. I simply had the feeling that the world on the other side of those eyes had very little in common with our own. What did you read? I asked my brother, needing an excuse to look away. Jake's breath was coming fast again. His fingers gripped his bedsheets on either side of him as though he were hanging on from a precipice and clinging for his life. The scariest story in the world, that's all, the old man said. Would you like to read it too? Jake was practically convulsing at the words. I was about to call a nurse. But the old man ran his long fingers down my brother's face, and his breathing immediately ceased. You can't get through to him if you don't know where his mind has been. The old man's voice had grown as melodic as a lullaby. Read the story, and if you keep your wits about you, then you will find the words to call your brother home. Okay, sure, yeah, I said, part concerned for my brother, part sibling rivalry and wanting to test myself but mostly it was just morbid curiosity. Is there a chance I'll end up like that? The old man smiled and stood. Saying nothing, he turned to exit the room. You can't expect me to follow you if you don't answer. I called after him. I absolutely can, he replied, and he was gone. And of course he was right. How could I not follow that begging question mark? and so the wind hollowed as I walked into the night with my companion. I asked him his name, and his voice betrayed nothing when he answered, Mr. Sandman. I assumed it was in jest, but I can't be certain. While we walked, he told me the tale of the demon scroll. This story was written over the course of four generations, beginning in the 6th century. 
after the man had fathered a son, he would take up the story and pour all he knew of fear into the manuscript. Once he had contributed what he was able, the man would collapse into insanity, passing that manuscript on to his heir when he came of age. If they knew the thing was evil, why wouldn't they just destroy it? Will you destroy it? Not until I've read it. Ah, Mr. Sandman said, tapping the side of his nose. And so it passes. Each son thought they could save their father through their own sacrifice. Yet each fell as their fathers had into madness. The old man had taken a turn on a street I didn't recognize, but I was too absorbed in his tale to pay it much attention. Well, maybe I'll destroy it then, if everyone who has ever read it. Not everyone, my companion interrupted. Four generations passed the scroll, until one son endured the trial. He maintained his sanity, helped his father recover, and even prospered for his greater sight into the heart of terror. Such was his love for the fear he found that he kept the scroll hidden and safe, until your brother discovered it by accident, of course. What happened to the boy? And how do you know this? The old man smiled over his shoulder, saying nothing. Well, what made him different that he was allowed to prevail? I pressed. The boy wasn't like the others. Mr. Sandman had left the road entirely and was now walking along a dark path through a dark copse. I was helpless but to follow. When you are brave, you fight against fear as though to conquer it. Only the cowardly know how to make fear their friend, as that boy once did. Here we are though, just where your brother left it. Mr. Sandman reached inside a rotted stump to produce a scroll. It was a length of animal hide, about three feet tall, its surface yellowed, and edges burned or tattered by age. He offered it to me freely, and I accepted. Can't you give me any idea what to expect? I asked. The thing was clenched in my hand, still rolled. I already have. His eyes didn't waver, fixed on my own. The wind held its breath as I held mine. I nodded, my mind made it last. Still meeting Mr. Sandman's eyes, I took a lighter from my pocket and set the flame to the scroll. If his eyes were the gates of hell, then they were now opened. An animal snarl escaped his throat as he launched himself at me, decrepit fingers clawed at my face, feeling like shards of bone digging into my skin. I tried to fend him off, prompting him to dig his yellowed teeth into my defensive forearm. There was no chance to reason with him. I couldn't flee with him latched onto me. All I could do was pummel his scruffy head with my free hand, over and over, each blow harder than the last as his teeth sank deeper into my skin. By the time he let go, his mouth was a fountain of blood which sputtered between his rotten teeth. You've read it, haven't you? I demanded, looming over the crumpled body. Tell me what's inside. The wet <laughs> laughter was nauseating. Then it stopped, and that was even worse. The wind started to whistle again, finally daring to breathe. The thick animal hide was slow to light, but I got it going with a little kindling. The stump, the scroll, and Mr. Sandman's body all joined in the pillar of flame. Fear is an evil thing. That's what I told myself in the heat of the moment, my bloody arm in agony. That it was a cursed knowledge the world would do better without. But each night, as I lie awake, my thoughts are bound to what was inside that scroll. And when my brother took his own life in the hospital, I had to wonder how things would have been different if I had striven to understand fear rather than flee from it. Maybe fear is an evil thing, but the fear of fear is even worse. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. You know, that pregnancy story really got to me. Of course, we've just had our baby. Well, we had her a few months ago now. But still, because I remember my wife being pregnant quite recently, it really did give me the chills while reading it. If any of you are pregnant out there, be careful. And I hope your baby doesn't start talking in the womb. I also want to give a huge thank you to my friend Mr. Lonely Dark. You of course have heard his incredible talents in this video. 
Truly spectacular. I love his voice. And I think if you've gotten to the end of the video, you probably do too. So you know what the next step is, right? That's right. I would really love for you to go over to his channel, show him a bit of love, subscribe, listen to some of his videos. He really, really deserves it. So what I'm going to do is leave a link on screen now in order for you guys to be able to check him out. You'll also be able to find a convenient link in the description. So please go over there, show him some love. And with all of that being said, I'm going to bid you all a good night. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.